good to see everyone gather together today to worship God. We're going to begin our service today. Uh, Kevin's going to lead us in the Star Spangled Banner, so we'll ask that you would stand and uh, direct your attention towards the flag. seated. Well, it is certainly good to see everyone and have the opportunity to gather in the freedom that we have been granted as, uh, as believers. So we do want to uh, just begin with a quick reminder that a uh, monthly meeting is planning to meet in here this evening at 7 o'clock, so um, please be aware that that's going on. I don't know, are there any other announcements we need to attend to this morning? If not, let's go, and, and I realize, like, I can ask for announcements, but, you know, we, we don't know what tomorrow brings right now, so we, we just, we acknowledge where, where we are, um, but it is, you know, we just want to have that available. Um, at this time, let's go into a time of prayer concerns and praises, um, and I ask that you continue to remember uh, as Vernon was saying he has some tests coming up, so let's continue to remember Vernon. Are there others we want to remember today? Yeah, Marty Lindley, thank you, sorry. Uh, let's continue to remember Marty. He's still in the hospital. Any others? Well, if not, let's, let's um, stand once again together and we will read our uh, first scripture and then go to God in prayer. And our scripture today comes from John chapter 3. Uh, it should sound very familiar. It's one of the most popular verses in scripture. Most people recognize it, but um, let's see what John has to share to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done 
in the sight of God. So let's go to God in prayer right now. God, we do thank you for the greatest gift we could ever receive, and that is life. And, and that life was given to us through Jesus Christ. He bought our freedom from sin, from death, and uh, Lord, we are here to worship you for that, for the great gift of life that we have received, God. Uh, we, we pray that this day, our, our time together would, would be a, a taste of that life, that as we are here to worship you, um, you, you would be building your kingdom in our lives, and uh, that uh, it would be just a taste of who you are as we are together today. Lord, we do want to pray right now over our concerns that were mentioned. We continue to lift up David and his family. We pray uh, for your comfort, your peace, and your strength to envelop them. Um, Lord, we pray for uh, Rhonda Kenton's family as she passed away this week. We pray for your, uh, your loving arms to wrap around them. Um, God, we, we pray for Vernon and the, the test that he's going to be facing over the next couple of weeks. Uh, be with him in a special way and uh, just continue to give him your peace. Um, and then, God, we also want to lift up Marty as he's still in the hospital and uh, facing uh, the possibility of, of some uh, minor procedures. We, we just lift him up and we pray that you would uh, give him his body the strength it needs. Uh, Lord, we, we just give you thanks for, for him and uh, just his, his faithful life and uh, the goodness that he brings into our world. And, and so, Lord, as we're here together today... Um, we, we lift up Jesus' name because we acknowledge where the name of Jesus is lifted up. Uh, it, is, it is a good place, and um, it's where we're meant to be. So, Lord, may our hearts lift you high uh, today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read our second scripture today. It comes from Malachi chapter 1. It's verses 1 through 5. A prophecy. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you asked, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. This time I invite you to join together in a period of open worship.
Heavenly Father, we thank You for this moment to be together. When we come into this place, we acknowledge that You are uh, reorienting how we experience this world. That You are setting our eyes towards heaven. That all the things that have distracted us and carried us away from Your love are are, uh, being pushed towards the side so that we can focus upon the love that You have for us. A love that will carry us Uh, through every day of our lives, and then it will carry us into eternity and will sustain us through all eternity. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that that is why we gather together today. To dwell in that love. That love that is our gift out of Your Son, Jesus Christ. God, we give You thanks that we have been granted the freedom to gather and to be a a body of believers, of of people who trust in the grace that is ours through Jesus Christ. We pray that You would guide us. We pray that You would speak to our hearts that uh, in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we are in this world, You are lifted up. That your, uh, Your kingdom is glorified through everything that we do. So God, we we just want to say we love You. We acknowledge that our presence here today is to say that we love You. What a good and blessed thing that is. So Lord, we thank You for this time. We thank You for the opportunity to gather. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder how many people go through their lives, and I think it would probably be the majority of people, that go through their lives and, and they're, uh, they have this imaginary stem. I think about how as a kid you, you would have the flowers and you'd pick off and, and someone would say, you know, he loves me or she loves me, she, he loves me or she loves me not. And we go through this process in, in life of how we're, we're trying to figure out, are we really loved? Am I really loved? Is is there anything especially special about me? And and so as I think about this scripture that we have been have been read that has been read before us today, I I feel like Israel is is in a place where they're just asking this question and they've they've gotten stuck on the He loves me not. They they feel like God's love has abandoned them, and so they're, they're, they're just stuck in a lot of ways. And that's one of the things that I love about Uh, the book of Malachi is Malachi is about trying to break these people out of the place where they're stuck. And so I believe that this message that uh, Malachi is speaking to the people of Israel is a message that can speak to us. And we're going to spend the next couple of months in this place uh, of Malachi uh, reading reading his his message to Israel. And and so as I think about this, why it's important today is because I, I believe if we pay attention to Malachi, we might learn a little bit more about why church. Why, why the church, the American church, the church in the world can often be stuck today. And, and I believe that our scripture today is the heart of Malachi's message, and I believe it's the heart of what God is trying to invite us to so that we can be set free to be the people He's called us to be. To be the, the witness in the world, and that is this idea of being loved by God. I mean, we would think being people who grow up, often grow up in church, we spend years and years uh, reading the Bible, participating in worship, serving in Sunday school classes, but sometimes something just switches at a point and, and we're, we no longer do it because we're loved, but we, we can often do it because we want God to love us. And there's a big difference between those two things. We, we, we want God to love us and we question God's love and so we go to, to, to do more and more and try to get God to love us. But we need to come back to just the, the basic premise of the Gospel and that is that we are loved. Period. No questions asked, but how often is it that we go back to that, that rose and we start picking off petals again? I'm loved. I'm not. 
And, and, and isn't that because of the circumstances that we have? We, we get news that just it, it crushes our souls. We, we get news that someone's sick or, or a family member has died or, or, or we have an argument and, or we have just struggles in families. And so we, we're going through and as life is happening, we're finding ways to pick off those flowers and ask that question, am I really loved? And we go through life in this way wondering if we are loved. And, and if, if we continue to sit in that place, church, we will become a, a people who are just stagnant and God is calling us to dwell, to abide in His rich love. It is a gift. It is, what, it is the heart of the Gospel that we proclaim. And so as I see this question that I'm going to focus especially on today, verse 2, the first part of it, I feel like this is a question so many people are asking. You, 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 I don't think that you could meet anybody that at some point is not asking this question. And especially right now, in so much turmoil, people are just wondering, what in the world is happening? Are we really loved? Is this just this meaningless experience that we go through 60, 70, 80 years? Or is there a purpose behind it? It is God doing something in the midst of it. And so that's why it's so important, church, that we remember that we are loved. We're loved. You are loved. And so what's happening in Malachi? Malachi in, in our Protestant Old Testament is the last book in the Old Testament. And, and um, it's, it's not in the actual Hebrew text of the Old Testament, but it's the last one. And it, it gives this beautiful connection between the prophets and the, and, and the law and the Gospels and the New Testament and all that is happening there. Uh, and so what's going on is that Malachi is writing to a people who have just come out of the exile. You're probably about 100 years after the exile, 400 years before Jesus is born, uh, that, that Malachi is speaking to this people. And so what's happened? Think about the exile. The, the people were taken out of their homeland, carried over in, into Babylon, and uh, the temple was destroyed. They thought that they had been completely abandoned, but prophets were coming and telling them, no, 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 God's not defeated. God is at work even now. God is at work through this. And, and so what happens after the exile, getting closer to the time where Malachi is writing, uh, Malachi is speaking to a people that have, they've rebuilt the temple. They've rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. So things are starting to come together, but they're still questioning. Is God still there? Because what, what happens is as they build this, they just realize it doesn't have the splendor of the good old days of David and Solomon and all those kings that came before. All the, the splendor seems to be gone from those times. You know, it's all, I, I think in, in moments like this, it's the people sitting around like Dorothy to Toto. We're not in Kansas anymore. It, it's not this wonderful experience that we thought we, we had uh, so long ago. And so what happens in the people's hearts, and this is the key, this is why I think this message is so important for the church period, the church, all the church, us the church, everywhere the church. We, we have to get back to the love of God and dwelling in the love of God. Not trying to earn the love of God, but being a people who are being transformed because they are loved. Because what happened in their hearts, they, they were questioning the love of God. They, they were not practicing sins in an exterior sense that they were outright sinning against God, but in their hearts. And this is where Malachi is going to focus over the next uh, few chapters. He, he's going to talk about their hearts and how even though they're not practicing sin on the outside, what they're offering back to God is half-hearted. They're not giving their best to God because they're questioning this love that God has for them. And from the outside, we might look at this people and say, well, things must not be so bad. But if you look at the hearts of this people, they are, are, are very much a half-hearted people offering their secondaries and, and even just un, unacceptable sacrifices to God. And, and it's going to work its way out in several different things. So in Malachi, we, we have this confrontation between God and and the people. And that's the reason I've titled this series Arguing with God because it goes through this process where God will say something or the people will say something and then they, there's this response. But you say, as you heard in our Scripture today, God says, I have loved you, but you ask, how have you loved us? And so this is why it's important. 
As this people are questioning God's love, it causes us to compromise our obedience. When we question if God loves us, we are going to compromise in some way our obedience to God. If, if God's not really going to come through when I step outside these doors after, after this service is over, man, I, I might not do what I would do otherwise. I might not live out, the, uh, live out my faith in a bold way. I might not share my faith uh, with, with my neighbor or my coworker because you know, I might be rejected by them. And so we're looking for acceptance by that person and forgetting that we are already accepted by the one person that matters. That one person being God. And so these people are, are questioning God's love. They're questioning God's love. Everything that Malachi is going to share with us is going to flow out of this place of how the people have been questioning God's love. So let's look at the scripture. We have this first, this, this beginning as a statement, just so we know what's going on, we can orient ourselves. It's a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. And there's just this great, uh, Malachi, all the words, all the names in the Old Testament have meaning. Malachi actually means my messenger. So this is that messenger, and we're going to see a little bit later on how, how Malachi even brings his own name into into the text, how God is going to send my messenger to you. And we believe that as Christians, that that forerunner, that messenger actually is uh, the prophet John the Baptist. And so that's why it's such a beautiful connection between the New, Old Testament and the New Testament. But here's the, here's the meat of this. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? How often do we go through life saying, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand why all of these things are happening around me. I don't understand why this is, is taking place. God, if you're really good, why are our situations like they are? Why do I continually have the troubles that I face? And so we live in this perpetual sense of questioning uh, of, of asking, pulling off another, another um, pedal on the rose and saying, God, I don't feel like you love me. How have you loved us? And, and, and I, want, I love, I don't often bring in Hebrew and Greek. I realize I am a geek when it comes to these kinds of things. Uh, and so I don't want to bore you, but I, I, I want to just take a moment to talk about the word that's there where God says that he loves the people of Israel. And that's extended to us as well. That word is ahava. And that word, ahava, that love, it's not a particularly like divine, only God, because there are words in the Old Testament that only God does. Like there is a word for creation when God created the heavens and the earth. That word for creation is only used for God. But when God says, I, God says, I ahava you, this word is not a particularly distant word where it's only a love that God shows. This is actually the kind of intimacy and care that a father would show for his child. It's, it's the kind of love that, that spouses would share between themselves. And so when God says, I love you, he, he's not saying this is only the kind of love that you can experience for me. He's saying this is the kind of love that you see when you live out whole and healthy relationships. Whenever our marriages are becoming more and more healthy, when our families are, are demonstrating love to each other, this is the kind of love that God is trying to bring to our minds when he says, I love you. I, I want a relationship with you. I want this intimacy with you because it matters. Our, our relationship matters. It's not just this foreign love that we only read about in the Bible. But every time we experience love between us and another person, this is the kind of love God is inviting us to. How often do we kind of kind of pigeonhole God's love and think this is the only way that God can show us love. You know, even, even our 11 o'clock hour that we typically meet, this is the time where we meet with God. And yes, I acknowledge that. It is a moment that we can meet with God. But God is saying, I want to break out of your, your boundaries that you've placed on me. And I want to show you the kind of love that is, is with you every single day. The kind of intimacy that you share every moment. God says that he loves you and it is this kind of love that is, is not the foreign love, but it's the kind of love that is shared between close companions. 
people who have spent time together and have invested in each other and just care for each other. This is the kind of love that God has for you, that he wants you. He, he wants to have a relationship with you. God, God doesn't want you to feel like you are pushed away and, and, and far and distant, but he, he wants for you to understand that he is drawing you close. He's drawing you into intimacy and into companionship. And so when I say God loves you, I just want you to accept it. But isn't that so hard? It's easy to say, just accept it. It's so hard to actually accept it. Because don't, when, when we look at ourselves, what? Well, I, I don't live a particularly good life. What, why would God love me? God loves you because he created you. God loves you because you matter to him, that you, you, you were just a twinkle in his eye before you, were a tw a tw uh, before you were a twinkle in your parents' eyes. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He loves you. He already has that close companionship with you, and he is simply inviting you to where he already is. He's already there, and he's saying, come, join me, be with me. Let's, let's share this love together. But it goes on, and this is, this is probably, so in the lectionary, it's this three-year set of scriptures that, that kind of cover the basic story of the Bible. This scripture is one of those that doesn't appear anywhere in that because these words, if we pay attention really, it makes us be like, is that really what we feel about God? I mean, look at these next, these next couple of sentences. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have, what? What's it say? Hated. You know, that's the antithesis of this intimacy and this relationship. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. And I'm going to stop here for just a moment because I want us to pay attention to this. this Jacob and Esau uh, become the, these names. As we think about Israel, who uh, does Jacob become when God renames him? What's the name he gets? His whispers, Israel. Israel is the name that Jacob's name is, uh, is changed to, and all his people take on the name of Israel because they come from uh, Jacob. And so Esau, as we're going to see just a few moments, it starts using this word Edom. Edom is the descendants of Esau in the same way that Israel is the descendants uh, of Jacob. And so we, we have this, uh, this tension that's going on in the scripture Esau and Jacob, if you think about their story, they, they were two brothers that until uh, Jacob goes away for years and years, uh, they, they don't get along, do they? They, they argue, they, they have all this struggle between the two of them. Jacob is constantly cheating his brother out of things, but uh, Esau is so impetuous that he sells his birthright, he sells his inheritance that he is meant to receive uh, for soup and for, and, and, and well, no, the birth blessing is stolen by Jacob and he sells uh, his inheritance for the for the soup that J Jacob had prepared because he thought he was going to die. He wasn't trusting God. And that's the heart of what's going on is that Jake, uh, Esau, Esau isn't trusting God. Esau is a person that's just moving at 100 miles in every direction that he can move because he, he's just, all he can have is what he earns on his own. It's very much what we can often experience as human beings living today. All we can have is what, we, what we're willing to work hard for uh, when, when the greatest possession, the greatest gift that we get in this world is the relationship and intimacy we have with God. And, and so I want you to hear, it's not just that God, it's not the idea that God hated Esau, but that as Jesus says in, in the New Testament, that we are called to, to love God in such a way that it seems like we hate our mother and our brothers and our sisters. That God's love that he has for, es for Jacob is such a love. And this is so hard not to mix those names up. I'm sorry if I do or if I have. Uh, but the idea is that God loves Jacob with such a love because he is the reci recipient of the promise. He is the recipient of the blessing that Abraham received. It's a blessing that was passed from generation to generation to the firstborn. And so the problem that's going on here is we continue reading. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. So what's taking place here? This people, though we have been crushed, 
we will rebuild the ruins. Think about who is taking on this activity. Edom is the one saying this. We're going to do it. We're going to build our lives. We're, we're going to be something because of what we do. And so they're fighting and they're, they're, they're arguing with everyone and they're, they're trying to do it apart from God. They're trying to operate without God. And so the reality is that as we try to work without God, what is happening is we are working against God because we have a choice ultimately. We can be like Jacob and accept the gift that God has given us. The gospel that says you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but the gift of God is life through Jesus Christ. You can accept it. Or you can live your life day after day trying to earn love. And think about all the ways people try to earn love. I almost thought about having, having us... Um, Having Kevin sing the song, uh, looking for love in all the wrong places. Because isn't that what people do right now? When, when they want to feel loved or feel like they matter, they, they turn to all of these things that in essence they destroy them. They, they turn to sex, they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, they turn to work and try to earn their way to being someone in this world. Not, not acknowledging that there already are someone because they are loved by God. And so when we try to work without God, what actually happens is that we work against God. We prevent God from being able to do the work. And I think about this, this moment and, and what Jesus says in, in John's gospel, apart from me, you can do nothing. When we try to build our lives and, and not trust in God and go to God first to ask God what he would have us do, we can do nothing. And so when we try to work without God, we are actually working against God. What's interesting is, is uh, Malachi is sharing this message. You, you would think it was quite the opposite. I'm sure that the people in Jerusalem and Israel that were there listening to him were like, what are you talking about? Because as Israel had been taken over into Babylon, the Edomites had been the ones that prospered out of it. They were left alone. They got to remain in their land. And so this people, uh, as, as Israel is hearing this, they're, they're probably like, what in the world are you talking about, Malachi? Because everything seems to be so upside down in what Ma Malachi is sharing. What happens, though, is we simply look at life through our human lenses and through our human standards. We can't see what God is doing very often. We can't see what God is trying to work out. And so whenever we choose to live as Esau and try to earn our way, what we try to be somebody and benefit off of the, at the expense of other people, we live as Esau and as Edom, but we can choose to live as Jacob and receive from God what God gives. Receive from God what he gives, which is his love. And that's not to say Jacob always gets it right. Go back to his story. He doesn't always get it right. He makes his mistakes. He, he tries to cheat. He's the one that steals the blessing. He's the one that, that goes and, and cheats his uh, father-in-law father Laban out of, the, out of the flocks and everything. There, there's a lot that happens in his life, and he has to be humbled by God. But he still bears the promise. He still carries the promise that God has for him. Whereas Esau feels like continually he has to blaze his own path. He has to earn his love. He, we, we go back to that first verse where God says, I have loved you, but you asked, how have you loved us? It doesn't matter if you're, uh, how long you've been a Christian, we can come back to this place where we ask, God, how have you loved us? We, we can continue to fall back into old patterns and old habits of life, and, and, and God is wanting us to move forward and to dwell with him and accept that we are loved. Imagine how would it change your life if you knew unconditionally, if you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew that unconditionally you were loved by God and nothing could take it away. That, that you could be rejected by people, you, you could be harassed, you could be taunted, whatever. You, you could even lose your life, but you can never lose the love of God. What might it change in you? Would it make you bold? 
would it cause you to be a, a little more faithful in what God is doing? And that's the reality of, of why it matters so much. If we question God's love, if we choose to question and say, you know, God, I don't really feel loved by you. What have you done for me lately? When's the last time you, you spoke out of the cloud in, into earth? We miss out on the blessings that God has for us. And so this is, this is the essence of it. God loves you. And because you are loved, everything changes. Now that, once again, is one of those easy phrases to say. Easy thing for us to think, and, and, and I think intellectually, th this is the problem for us as Christians, especially in, in the time that we're living. Intellectually, we can agree with this. God loves you. We can say it. We can tell it to each other. God loves you. But how often do we go back and we question it? How often do we say, you know, look at our, I'll look at my circumstances and be like, God, how have you loved me? As I'm looking down the barrel of, uh, of tests that are going to be uh, taken at the, at the doctor's office, how have you loved me? As loved ones go on to, to meet Jesus, how have you loved me? But God loves you. And because you are loved, everything is changed. Everything is different. Because we are loved, we can face the most difficult of circumstances. It, it, it means that we no longer depend on our circumstances to tell us who we are. It doesn't matter what's in our bank account that says who we are. It doesn't matter what awards are in our trophy case to say who we are. It doesn't matter who loves us in the world because we are loved by God. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. We are loved by God. And because we are loved by God, it's a call to boldness. It's a call to a sacrificial type of living. That, that we, because we are loved by God, we wouldn't want to offer him secondary things. I think about in, in marriage is just such a great reminder of how we don't have it together. It's a great mind, reminder for me of how I don't have it together. Because what will happen is there are times when, when I, I can just become frustrated with Mary because, you know, she, she didn't put up her shoes the way I asked her to, uh, to be able to put up her shoes. And um, she, she will, will just, I feel, can feel like she's taking advantage of me and that I'm just doing so much more than she is doing around the house because I'm the one that cooks and I'm the one that puts away the dishes. And I'm sorry, guys, if that gets you in trouble. I just try to help out. Um, but... But I can get to this place where I feel like, man, I'm doing so much. What is she doing? And that's where it's a problem. Because it, it, it means that I start to question, does she really love me? And as I begin to question, does she really love me? It changes how I treat her. I, I can become a little more harsh. I can become a little bitter towards her. I, I can feel like I'm going to give her a taste of her own medicine in those moments where I, I've been working to have the meal and it's just not quite done yet. And I feel like I, I can be impatient whenever she comes in the door. And so I, whenever I question her love, I don't give her my best. In fact, if what she's getting in that place in that moment is probably the worst that I have to offer her. But isn't that how it happens with God? When we question if God loves us, we, we tend to hold back from God. We tend to not be as generous in, in, in sharing love, and that love can be through our, our taking time to be with God. I mean, if God hasn't come through for me in a long time, why am I going to give God the time of day? Why am I going to keep reading this, this scripture whenever I feel like God's not doing what I think God should do? Why am I going to keep coming to church when I feel like God has forgotten me? When I feel like God has forgotten my family or forgotten someone that I love? When, when the prayers that I have prayed for so long haven't been answered, why do I keep going to God? See, the problem is we define God's love by our circumstances in, instead of the fact that we are simply loved. That is not going to change. That will never go away. You are loved I think with this we have to ask ourselves ultimately is it really enough is it really enough for me just to accept that God loves me I've actually asked Kevin if he would come and close us in one more song um, this song is good good father because uh, so often it, it, it's not that we need to be taught something different or new 
It's that we need to be reminded. As believers, we need to be reminded that God does love us, that God does have good plans for us, and our circumstances are not determining of those plans and of what God has for us. And so this song, I I love this song, Good, Good Father, uh, because it reminds us, it gives us a picture of who God is. And so let's just take a moment, we'll hear Kevin share with us uh, this song. stories of what they think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. I've seen many searching for answers. For you to stand as we close in prayer today. As you're standing, I just wanted to say one thing. I think about how I read at the beginning John 3, 16. Just a reminder, I wanted it to be a part of this service because so often we can question God's love. We can say, God, how have you loved us? 
But God has shown us his love through Jesus Christ, that he gave his one and only son so that we could have life, so that we wouldn't be under judgment, but so that we might be set free. And so I just want to pray over you today. So let's pray. God, I pray for your people that are gathered here. I pray for your church throughout the world, that as we leave from the church building, as we walk out of this place, may we walk in your love. May we trust the words that Malachi begins with, I have loved you, says the Lord, and that we put a period after. We stop questioning, but we live in the freedom and the grace and the life that is in those words, I have loved you. That there's nothing that can take that love away, that there's nothing that we could do to overwhelm and to discount that love, but we have been loved by a God who, who would move heaven hell and earth to bring us back together and so we thank you lord that you have loved us may we walk in that love may we be a people who pour that love out into the world because we have been loved by such a great love a love that doesn't just want to see us and be with us on sunday morning but a love that wants that intimacy every single day i have loved you god may we live and dwell and abide in that promise that we are Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.